on the last Concorde to fly, the last supersonic airplane to fly anywhere in the world. So this was the last company I ever made, also the last we ever fly. But aside from all that, this was the test bed for the modifications after the Paris crash. So the fuel tank liners, the armor plate in around the landing gear wiring, were all test fitted to this aircraft. So British Airways offered this aircraft because it was about a ton lighter than the others, because it was the last off the production line. So this done all of the um, proving flights to assure that the modifications worked and they were safe. Air France utilised the new tyres on the air fleet and then of course that was presented to the CAA and Concorde regained its certificate of airworthiness. You can just about see the bracket for here, the hinge. Uh -huh. Alright, so for taxiing and takeoff, this would lower to 5 degrees and the visor would tuck itself into the nose structure and then for landing, it would go down to the next selection, which is 12 and a half degrees. It's can't get out to come in at a very steep angle attack for landing. The engine's still on board. So this big intake here, all right, so we've got a pair of under here, okay? You see these ramp ramps with danger on? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you've got these other steel doors right here. The engine actually doesn't start until this red line. So in this 11 or so feet here, the jet engine can only accept air coming into it subsonically, about 500 miles an hour. The Concorde does 1,350 miles an hour. So the design is that to come up with a way of slowing that air down within that short 11 feet before it hit the turbine of the engine. And it was the intake system they came up with. These ramps are controlled by computers up on the flight deck. And we're talking about the 60s now, okay? But these ramps would move through the flight and the position in the ramps was crucial because what they did they would slow the air down from 1350 miles an hour to around about 350 miles an hour in just this 11 feet but the beauty of that you had a lot of excess air blowing through the turbines which created thrust mm -hmm. so as a result at supersonic speed these engines were the most fuel efficient in the world because the engines were only producing about 30 percent of the power the rest was coming from the excess air blown through the turbine from the intakes. We saw the one inside there, didn't we? For the Vulcan, but this is completely different, all right? Most of the components on this are titanium, and this re this version has got reheat or afterburner. Mm -hmm. So the reheats would come on for takeoff, and they would accelerate the aircraft from standing start to 250 miles an hour in around about 40 seconds at normal weight, 182 tons or if they were doing one of the charter flights on the Bay of Biscay where there's no luggage, the acceleration was faster than the Formula One racing car. So those buckets would generate the amount of thrust going through the, through the system for the engines for the exhaust. So when it comes into land, like I said, there's no flaps or slats to slow it down. So you've got the carbon fibre brakes, plus you've got a very, very powerful reverse thrust system on this aircraft. Those buckets would then close inwards like that to wow. reverse the thrust. So it would slow the aircraft down from 186 miles an hour, which was typical landing speed, down to within about 20 miles an hour in a very, very short time. And the amount of noise and the actual force you could feel from the, the, I can uh, imagine. the thrust was really quite something. Yeah. Rear cargo hold. Another one of the hot uh, tubes, so there's a sink there for the rear galley. Ah. So this landing here at the back. Mm -hmm. So this was here to protect the rear fuselage because of the very steep angle attack on takeoff and landing. As far as we know from speaking to former BA crew, they never used it. Wow. Air France, on the other hand, <laughs> had a very bad landing in the 80s with one of their Concords in a place called Dakar, uh -huh. where they did come in too steep and they crushed the rear fuselage.
to see four little piano keys. Oh yes. So they're the reheats. Wow. The little calculators, that's the inertial navigation system. So one for the captain, one for the first officer, one for the engineer uh -huh. to plot the route. The centre display with all the the quadrant of um, was it? It's uh, four engine dials, so four down, four across, or five down, four across, I should say. So that's everything there: oil pressure, fuel flow, power, etc. Yeah. Okay. Underneath the nose and visor selector, can you see that little amber, red, and green panel? So that tells you if the landing gear is retracted or has come down, and it's locked. So it have four greens. Uh huh. To the left of that, can you see, there we are, you got it. Yeah. Okay, center of gravity for the flight, for the crew to keep an eye on it. Wow. And you've got it on the back, on obviously here in the flight engineer's panel as well. Well, the most modern instrument on there, the only glass instrument on the aircraft, again, is, remember where the Mach meter was? That's TCAS, traffic avoidance. Ah. Oh. All aircraft had to have it, uh -huh. so it can't go to no exception, so that they had to be fitted to the fleet. Wow. Look at that. That's real flying, isn't it? Absolutely. You could fly it with your fingertips. And it, flying at Mach 2, you could put a 50 pence piece on top of those throttles and it wouldn't move. Circuit breakers. Mm -hmm. And then this door is uh, signed on the back. It is, yes, yeah, she's showing you. And that. this is that's a reproduction. A reproduction. Of it. Main plate. galley, forward galley, sorry. So you got your ovens. All the cutlery, is it still inside? In there? Coffee makers. They had a, a fresh red rose every flight. Yes. Day. Yes. And, there, and all, as you came on board, there were a dozen red roses on See? there. on a good day and I'm flat footed and uh, not a lot of room in here. I know but the difference between Ferrari and Cadillac. You're not wrong man, you are not wrong. <laughs> so you've just been on the British Airways flagship. I finally got to go on a Concorde and um, yeah what an experience. Smaller than I was expecting the flight deck to be. I think the cabin was even smaller than I was expecting it to be um, and unfortunately I'll never get to feel the, uh, the power of her but we've had an incredible tour around and I'm very grateful. So thank you very much. Really My pleasure. appreciate that.